Oh, yes, that's cute. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome for today's special edition of Lunch and Learn. So I'm your host, Chris Tronson. I don't have my partner in crime with me, Liz. I do get to see her this weekend in person, so I'm super excited. Um, but she can't make it today, so it's just going to be me. So I apologize for all the Liz fans that have like their you know, bobbleheads and signs up. She won't be here today, but she'll be back with me next week, I promise. Um, but yeah, she's, she's taking care of her health. So she'll be here next week. But welcome, welcome, welcome the ISDF. We always enjoy having you at our virtual programming. So on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 uh, noon Eastern, we will either for the first and third Wednesday of the month, have an Ask the Experts with Dr. Liz and myself. And then on the fourth Wednesday, like today, we have a Lunch and Learn. So the topic of today's stream is OCD and health anxiety. So this is something that a lot of you have asked about, you've had comments about, and I'm so excited to have two experts on, which I'll introduce in a second, uh, one coming from lived experience and one coming from the clinical piece. So a little bit about myself. My name is Chris Tronson. I'm a licensed therapist here in Orange County, California at the Gateway Institute where I treat OCD, body dysmorphic disorder, related disorders, as well as being an IOCF lead advocate. So I have OCD myself and talk about it. And then I also am a board member of OCD Southern California and a board member of the IOCF. So coming here today from uh, both the clinical and lived experience piece, and I really, really enjoy having you today in the stream. As always, please make sure to announce where you're from. We always like to see where you're joining us from because we're at the noon time. We get a lot of the international people. So we're always excited to see where everybody's from, especially because when I travel, I'm going to ask to stay at your house, which is not creepy at all. Um, so announce where you're from, who you're here to support and ask questions throughout the stream. So I'm going to introduce the two people on my screen in a second, but we have some cool housekeeping stuff that I have to take care of. Some quick announcements and then we're going to dive right in. So as always, remember that this live stream is educational and it's not intended to replace therapy. For treatment related questions, please work with your provider or contact a local clinician. You can use the IOCDF's online resource directory at iocdf.org forward slash find dash help and locate a trained clinician near you. The IOCF is not a crisis hotline. So if you're in a crisis or you're feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room, call 911 or the 988 suicide and crisis, crisis hotline. Uh, you can dial 988 or go to 988lifeline.org. And then lastly, we want to create a safe space and be kind and respectful to everyone. At the end of the day, we're all here to support one another. And note that this is being broadcast on several social media platforms and being recorded. I'm going to make some announcements at the end, but I'm going to tease them right now because one of our good friends uh, to the program and to the IOCDF, Katie O'Dunn, has been putting in her blood, sweat, and tears for the IOCDF's virtual OCD and Faith Conference, which is happening in less than a week on Monday, May 1st, and you can still sign up. And then we are so excited to announce, I believe both of the, I know Ethan's going to be there, and I believe Dr. Where it's will be there as well because the 28th annual OCD conference is happening in San Francisco the second weekend of July. So you can go to both of those on the IOCF website and register. But without further ado, let me introduce my guest. So I'm going to go with Ethan first because he's on the top of my list on the bio. So that's there's no favoritism, I promise. Um, so Ethan Smith is currently uh, lives in the Los Angeles and Atlanta areas, working as a writer, director, producer, and OCD advocate and consultant. Ethan was born with OCD and struggled the majority of his life until receiving life treat. You know what? I'm not going to read it. I feel weird uh, reading Ethan's. I just want to say it from the heart. So if you don't know, Ethan hosts all of our live streaming on Tuesday evenings at 7 o'clock Eastern time, 4 o'clock Pacific. What I want to say about Ethan is he has an incredible talent on not only speaking about OCD, but incorporating people in our community, making people feel like wanted, supported, really kind of speaks from the heart. I'm excited to hear his story today. And he's doing a lot of really good work and actually helped um, make it that we finally have an OCD commercial out, uh, constantly hitting the airwaves. He, he directed that. So we're really, really lucky to have him. But I will read the part that he is a girl dad of two adorable kittens. So, Ethan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for the kind words, Chris. Yeah, they're making appearances. I think Bonnie's kind of doing some weird stuff behind me. And uh... Yes. They're <laughs> right. like, I have to steal the show. That's what cats do. They do. They do for real. Thanks for having me, Chris. Yes. And I'm excited about having Ethan today because obviously he's going to talk about his experience with OCD and health anxiety. And um, actually, I've heard him speak about this topic a lot, and I think it's really powerful. But what I'm even more excited about is I've never got to see them talk together. I know that they've done live streams in the past, and I've 
caught them, but I get to host one. So I always think it's powerful when somebody with OCD and their clinician meet up and they're going to be talking together today. So our other guest of the show is Dr. E. Katia Moritz. E. Katia Moritz is a licensed psycho- psychologist in Florida, New York, Utah, and Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Um, but I, I believe you're in Florida, right? I'm in Florida and New York. So oh. I'm in Florida today. Uh, yes. Tomorrow I'm in New York. So yeah, oh. both. Cool, cool. Um, And she is a board certified in cognitive and behavioral psychology and a fellow of the Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, ABCT. Together with Dr. Jonathan Hoffman, she founded the NBI Ranch and Neurobehavioral Institute, the NBI, where she is chief clinical officer. Dr. Moritz is the training director and supervisor of NBI APICC approved postdoctoral training program, which is amazing. That means that she's helping train future OCD specialists. Uh, She specializes in the treatment of severe anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, and related disorders and autism spectrum disorders. Her work focuses on complex and hard to diagnose patients, training, and interventions for families. She's on the Scientific and Clinical Advisory Board and the Diversity Council of the International Obsessive Compulsive Foundation, or the ISDF, which you're here with us today. Uh, She is also on the advisory board of HAAPE, helping adults with autism perform and excel. Dr. Moritz is the author of Working with Obsessive Compulsive Disorder in Children. There's audio and video training program, forms for helping children with OCD, and Blink, Blink, Clop, Clop, an OCD storybook, English and Spanish versions. Furthermore, she is the director and the producer of the award-winning documentary, Undiagnosed, The Future of Medicine. So Dr. Moritz, welcome to the show. It's so good to finally like e-meet you on one of these streams. I know you've done them before, but never with Liz and myself. So it's good to have you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So I want to jump jump right in. Um, You know, obviously OCD and health anxiety is something that impacts a lot, a lot of people in our community. Um, and I want to kind of, you know, go across the, the, the different aspects of the disorder. So people really leave here with both like a clinical and a lived experience, robust experience. So I'm going to talk, talk with you first, Dr. Moritz, is tell us a little bit about the definition, like what constitutes an individual? Maybe they're watching right now, wondering if they have it. What would be some of those telltale diagnostic criteria that we would see if somebody's experiencing health anxiety or, you know, OCD around their health? Yeah, I, I want to give you a little bit of a perspective historically, since I'm old and been here too long, um, you know, um, but, but, you know, hypochondriasis was a term that we used before when someone's health and fear of illnesses and fear that something was happening to them that was more serious um, and that they had, uh, they had to focus on that to save themselves, save their lives. Um, in the past was not even part of our diagnosis, it was called hypochondriasis, right? And over time, we recognized that that focus on health was no different than the focus on other OCD symptoms. And, you know, and we more and more realized that the treatment for health anxiety had to be really mirroring what we did for other kinds of anxieties related to OCD symptoms. And so um, the, the concept is all of us are concerned about our health. So don't get me wrong. You know, the same way as everybody washes their hand to not get sick. And if they, you know, do things that they're normal every day, they check things to make sure they did it right, you know. So, you know, being concerned about your health and, you know, more so now than ever where people are talking about, you know, um, medicine 3.0, where we take a lot of ownership of the things we do to have a better health. It's going to be part of the conversation. But there is a moment where your reaction to the topic of anything to do with your health becomes actually the focus of your life. So any symptom or anything is uh, actually turned into a disaster, a catastrophe. So our bodies change all the time. You have feelings, nausea, pains, all of that is part of normal functioning of the body. But every time that you feel that, it actually indicate something significantly wrong and you have to take an action to prevent a disaster or a, a you know terrible outcome so you know i like to compare to the flying fear you know uh, planes have to move planes don't fly smoothly there is you know they have that part of flying and if every time the plane moved you really believe that the plane is going to crash flying is going to be very difficult so for me a person with health anxiety is actually misperceiving the very normal, regular, day-to-day things that sometimes are a sign of a a condition, an illness or something, but their 
perception and reaction takes over their lives and then takes over their time, their brain, their focus. They can't think of anything else, but I need to prevent this from happening. And that's for me how I see uh, health anxiety. Um, before I bring Ethan in, can you talk about what I see in the presentation? Sometimes people are afraid of getting something and then others uh, read any kind of physical, physical sensation as a disastrous outcome, something that's undiagnosable or, or lethal. Um, and sometimes it seems like maybe people have both. So can you talk a little bit about the different ways that this presents? Right, right. So, so to me, like if you're afraid of getting a specific illness, you know, it's to me more like an OCD regular, like, so I'm afraid of getting, let's say, uh, like losing my eyesight, right? So all about the eyesight, what, some, what if something goes into my eyes? What if I use a shampoo and that that shampoo goes into my eyes and I go blind? Um, that to me is a very specific, I wouldn't call that health anxiety. I'll call a fear of blindness, right? So it's health related, but it's very specific. When it comes to health anxiety, it could be anything that has to do with your health. And usually it doesn't present only like, I'm afraid of one condition. Yes, I have a bigger fear of a condition, but everything else also is scary to me. So you're right, Chris, that you can have both. You can have a specific fear of one condition that like OCD crowned as this is my issue. But when you ask about other questions, everything is so misperceived in the body that creates this hypervigilance that makes everything so noticeable. So you may be afraid of going blind, but every time you feel nauseous, you run to the doctor because what if it's something in your stomach that is going wrong? So those things can actually happen at the same time. Ethan, um, I, I was going to ask you a, for a question, but I want to ask you a different question because of something Dr. Dr. Moritz said, and then I'll get back to the original question. She, you know, she just talked about like that, that urgency, like I have to go to the hospital. What if this is something, can you talk about the responsibility you, you know, this, this is a, a subtype that you experience. So can you talk about that responsibility piece of like, I got to be taking care of myself. I got to keep my health. Okay. Like, what does that feel like as somebody that's living with this? Yeah, it's definitely intense. I mean, the idea, our brains operate, they're basically like stay alive machines, right? Our, our, our brain's job is to make sure that we're healthy and alive and, and survive. And so, you know, we're taking that brain, that sort of lizard brain um, and into this, into like present day where um, to Katia's point, you know, we're constantly scanning and checking and anything that may be perceived as a threat to our lives is something that we need to address and take care of and can't risk it being something more than it is. I, I like the Katia sort of divided up health anxiety into two spectrums because I relate to both of them. The first thing is I, for many years, I was afraid of getting something, but really had no proof that I had it or, or was going to have it, right? It was simply like, what if I get this thing? What if I get MS? What if I get cancer? What if I get HIV, right? And, and I really didn't have any, um, any facts to back that up. It was just an ongoing fear. So anytime I did have a symptom that um, had probably nothing to do with that fear, um, I would correlate the two. Um, so that would be one piece of my health anxiety. The other piece of my health anxiety would be when there would be something to latch on to, when I would have a physiological or somatic symptom, um, then in that case, you know, that would be further proof that something is wrong with me and that I need to be vigilant and make sure that I'm okay and check it out. Um, at the end of the day, health anxiety for me was really tricky because it was rooted as many subtypes and symptoms of OCD are, it was rooted in something tangible. It, you, you read articles where I had a headache and I, and I blew it off and three days later I had a stroke, you know, and, and you hear that and that is a tiny percentage of the population but it's still something real. And so, you know, my brain goes, well, I have this headache and it's something I need to pay attention to because this could happen. And therefore I'm validated and being overvigilant. Um, and so that's sort of where it can get really, really messy. Right. Um, so. Yeah. And, and before I go back to Dr. Moritz, the other question I was going to ask is she explained really well, this, this subtype, um, can you talk a little bit about maybe the first presentations for you? When did you start to notice like, hey, or when did maybe family and loved ones, if it wasn't originally you, notice like there's something different? We all care about our health, like Dr. Mertz was saying, but there's something else going on here. Yeah, uh, I think I, well, I, I'm old enough to have had, you know, been diagnosed with hypochondriasis, the old school term. Um, and I think, you know, it presented early on, I think when I was a kid with, 
the fear of choking itself wasn't necessarily health anxiety, but being afraid something was physically wrong with me. Um, and it started to manifest uh, really pervasively in high school where I was constantly afraid of having a fever. I was so scared of this fever and what did it mean? And if my temperature was high or went up above a certain temperature, then something was wrong with me and I needed to go to the doctor. But I was literally going to the doctor for anything. And I actually loved going to the doctor. Like I would become a totally different person at the doctor. I'd make jokes. I'd be, I was so psyched to be there because it was like the safest place imaginable. So, I mean, at any given time I was at the doctor because there was something small. Um, there was like a red dot on my stomach, but what if it's MRSA? And I went to the doctor going, this is MRSA. You need to fix this. And they were like, it can't be what, you know, um, or my temperature is too high. And they're like, you might have a fever, but it could be meningitis too. We need to prevent this. Right. So it was during high school. I was constantly going to the doctor for all of these things. And they were really catastrophized versions of a symptom that was probably nothing. Right. Or just the overall fear of I need to get checked out and make sure that my blood is okay because what if I have this thing and I need to be prepared and catch it early? Because it's all about catching it early. You hear all the news, we caught it early and we saved their life. So it's a can't risk, not early detection is the key, you know? And that's kind of, once that started, my parents started going, hmm, he really enjoys going to the doctor a lot. Um, and this is potentially problematic. And it wasn't even for the lollipops because that's why I used to like going. It was like for the actual like you know, CT scans. And, you know, <laughs> Dr. Murray, it's one thing that Ethan said. Um, I think sometimes people, one of the things that people don't understand who don't have it is like, how can somebody, you know, Ethan was talking about high school. How can somebody young think that there's something wrong? So can you talk about the way that OCD with this subtype sort of tricks people? Because I, I would say, you know, people imagine like this is, oh, it's somebody who's in their 70s and they're going, but no, I mean, there's, there's teens, there's kids that have this. So how does the disorder trick people into thinking they have something when the doctors are coming back like, hey, there's nothing going on? Yeah, uh, so so I, I would say that this is a difference between possibility and probability. Uh, was it a possibility that Ethan had uh, meningitis? Of course, it's always possible, but the probability is so low that we are not going to bet our lives on that, right? The same way as if you're on the plane and there's a tiny bump, that does not mean that the plane is crashing, right? So planes bump around all the time, and very rarely they crash. And very rarely a dot in your stomach means MRSA. You know, could it be MRSA? But it could, you know, it likely it's not, right? So, so I think that the difference is uh, noticing that you're living on a probability like it's a possibility. So the, the, they merge into one thing. So anything that is possible become 100% probable, and therefore I need to protect myself from it, right? The problem is, is that's the sad part about health anxiety because it makes you sick. So you are so nervous and so worried about illness that the biggest illness you develop is health anxiety. So, you know, Ethan and other people would say that what took the most time and effort and worrying and issues weren't the disorders themselves, but just the worrying about them, right? So they were sick, but they were sick because the health anxiety made them sick, right? So, so it's that balance between, you know, anything we do, should you go in a car and drive? Wait, there are car accidents, should we do it? Uh, yes, there is a possibility. But because we have to live on probabilities, we actually go ahead and say, well, okay, well, I'm gonna have to take a chance. The question is about life and chance. Everything in life has a risk and we measure risk. For me, health anxiety is the brain's inability to measure risk. The same way as flying phobias, driving phobias, and other things that are common things in life are a error in evaluating the risk. So Ethan, when he saw a dot in his stomach, his risk evaluation was no, this could be something so, so dangerous. Um, now, the chances of that being true are so, so slim that it's not worth his entire life effort and his time into that because before we made those evaluations, we need a little bit more data, right? So, you know, MRSA doesn't come with a dot in your stomach, <laughs> right? It comes with all kinds of other things. And that's how people wait up a little bit and say, hey, if I develop other things, then I'm going to start getting worried about. I'm going to start getting worried about. When you have health anxiety, 
that start getting worried about start from that moment of noticing anything that is slightly out of the ordinary or even ordinary that you didn't notice. And that triggers a whole host of like physiological reactions that should happen if you were to have 10 of the symptoms and, 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 and a sickness that you know, like, hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sick right now. I have a, there's 10 symptoms and I have a really high chance of having it. So during COVID, I think that a lot of people experience what it's like to have health anxiety, which I thought was fascinating because I thought I had COVID 60 times. Um, okay, yeah. Right. I mean, all yeah, those- a lot of people did. They were always like, I think I have it. I think I have it. Okay. I took a test. It, I, I don't. I yeah. Great. And, and, and it's almost like, like, uh, trust me when you have it, you know, kind of like, like you, you do know. Uh, but, but the idea was that because we didn't understand, we were so uh, sensitive and triggered by that thought because we didn't know. And we were so scared of what we didn't know that unknown was so difficult for the population. And I think it gave us a little bit of a, an experience what it is to have this concern. Uh, but for, you know, when you, when you have OCD, it wasn't like, Oh, I think I have COVID, but I'm going to try to figure it out. I'm just going to take a little precaution and figure it out. Um, when you have OCD that stops you dead in your tracks. So it's that moment of like lizard effect, like <gasps> what if is this? And then it becomes that. So all of a sudden, what's so sad about health anxiety is if you talk about with people that had a a diagnosis of cancer or a brain disorder or something very traumatic and meaningful, they tell you they remember the moment that they got that, like that moment stopped everything, right? So imagine that happening all the time to people with OCD, the enormous amount of energy and physiological response that they have to endure because that moment of the bad news comes with a thought, not with a whole study with a doctor and a formal diagnosis. So that's why I want people to be very compassionate about this. It's not like, oh, they're just worried about their health. It's like, just think about it. When you heard a friend that had a terrible diagnosis given to them and the trauma, the experience, the terrible feeling they got, and they had to work through that, actually that moment of like hearing about the disorder. Imagine if you keep hearing it a hundred times a week, that's a terrible feeling. Absolutely. And, and you just hit on something. I mean, it's not what I try to explain to people when having OCD is it's not just like a thought. It's like the terror of coming through it. So Ethan, for you, like when you've had had some of those health scares, you know, Dr. Mertz just kind of touched on it. It's not just like a thought. And then you kind of, you know, it's, it's almost like an experience, I think is the way I describe it. So for you, what was it like having those ups and downs and ups and downs and all that stuff with your health? What, what did that do kind of like emotionally that toll on you? Yeah, it's exhausting and it's super challenging, you know, for sure. And I think that there's two evolutions to my own health anxiety. You know, there's kind of what I what I went through when I was really struggling with OCD and on the backside of OCD being sort of 13 years in remission is I've, I've started experiencing new versions of health anxiety and what that looks like to me. Right. And Katya knows some of it because I, I called her last year about some stuff. But um, so so I think that a it's absolutely exhausting. And Katya is right. She raises a great point. You know, that that initial thought that is triggered by either a thought or a physical reaction summons this intense feeling of emotion that you would get at a diagnosis. So like you're already starting so heightened that each, you know, each moment that you go through the process, you know, I'm I'm getting more and more anxious and more and more, um, you know, terrified, for lack of a better word, um, as I go through this process, you know, for me. I'll back up a little bit. There were, there were two things that came to mind. And, and so my health anxiety manifested in a number of ways when I was really ill. And, and I remember working with, or talking with advocating for um, an individual with health anxiety. And I remember he would stare at his hand waiting for it to tremor because he was afraid he was going to get MS. Right. And he would constantly ask me, do you see it tremoring? Do you see it shaking? And it wasn't shaking. But he was constantly, he's like, I I know it's not shaking, but it's going to shake. And when it does, I might have MS, right? And I related to a lot of that um, health anxiety and that OCD symptomatology myself. I had a lot of that prevalent um, before I got better. So much of that type of thing has pretty much disappeared for me in terms of, um, you know, speculative uh, fear around, you know, well, what if I do get cancer or what if I do get 
any one of those things. I'm really good with coping around that uncertainty of just like I may get hit by a car or anything else. I, you know, sure that may happen and I'll cross that bridge. What gets me now is when I actually experience a somatic symptom that, um, that I'm not familiar with. Like I know what my body does and how it responds to anxiety, right? So when I experience something new that I haven't experienced before and in my head, my head automatically creates a rule that says, okay, I'm going to sit with the discomfort for four days. And if it doesn't disappear in four days, then I'm going to freak out. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> not conscious, but that's literally what happens. I determine some rule and be like, well, that's weird, but like, I'm sure it'll disappear. And then using my extensive medical background, i.e. Google and, um, <laughs> and using and using all of my years of schooling um, after four days, four hours and 43 minutes, I suddenly go, oh, my God, I'm going to die at something serious. This is not something I've experienced before, uh, when in reality, there's still a myriad of things. So that's kind of like and I talked about it in my other live streams. I talked about PVCs. I talked about tongue twitching and things that have come and gone and and over the over the last year, year and a half. And um and they've been challenging because they aren't symptoms that are in my anxiety repertoire. So in my head, because it's something that I haven't experienced before, it is unusual, you know, then this must be something serious. And I have a lot of trouble sitting with the discomfort surrounding those things. Yeah. Uh, before I ask my next question, first of all, I see all the questions in the chat and I promise I'll get to them. I just want to get some stuff out there and I'll let either of you take it or both of you take it. What are, and maybe Ethan, you could talk from personal experience and then Dr. Moritz just in general, but what are some of the common compulsions? Like if somebody is doing this physically or mentally, what are the, the, the more common things people do? So somebody watching this that might be on the fence, if they have it, they might notice some of these uh, rituals in themselves. I would argue that the probably most common compulsion having to do with health anxiety is Googling. <laughs> I, I, I would almost be certain that that is the go-to um, response in addition to like sort of the, the hypervigilant scan when we look at, we kind of check our bodies every morning and go, okay, I think we're, yep, we're good. Nothing, nothing, you know, nothing screaming at me right now, but Googling is definitely like the number one. In fact, I remember when I got smart speakers, I was laying in bed with Katie and I turned to her and I was like, oh my gosh, I can Google from bed. Like, <laughs> I can, I was like this and I was like, Hey Google, is this bad? <laughs> you know, it was like fantastic. It was like, but I think definitely Googling, obviously like further and exploring whatever the symptom is, whether it's a fear of something, I'm afraid I'm going to get this. I'm afraid that this may be something. So I'm going to Google um, all of the possible symptoms of what that is. So I know what to look for. And then I look for it every day, this hypervigilance, this constant reviewing of physical and, and mental well-being. Um, and then obviously, if you're going to the doctor, if you're going to the ER to get checked, you're getting all kinds of testing and diagnostics and taking that a step further to double check and triple check. And you're just not satisfied with the level of certainty that you're getting, which you're never going to get complete certainty, as Katya said, right? Um, so those are some initial um, compulsions that that have to do with health anxiety. But I think the scanning and checking and the immediate, you know, Googling and reviewing and, and thinking and, and so forth are some uh, initial initial compulsions. Yeah. I would add to what Ethan is saying, and definitely Googling is an interesting new one, because when Ethan was diagnosed with uh, hy uh, hypochondriasis, we may not even have Googled that. We didn't have even have internet. Honestly. Internet, right? <laughs> you had to send a carrier pigeon to the hospital. I did. I had to like, well, and, 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 and then send yeah. it to someone. Yeah, it was harder, because you had to go to the library and look for the books and try to figure it out. But... Well, I think that it is a lot about like physical checking also. Um, so you watch people, you know, check their pulse, check their temperature. Um, they check, um, you know, their their body parts compulsively and they look and then it's not enough. And then they look again, it's not enough. And then if they feel anything, they go back to it and back to it and back to it. Um, and uh, in a way they feel they will be safer. You know, it's a question of like, I have the responsibility to, you know, have this advance notice on what's happening because preventing the worst is no knowing that there's a problem here. Right. Um, so so I, I, I do think that there is a knowledge reassurance, which never reassures you because you're never going to find the answer you're looking for. But there is a physiological reassurance as well. Um, the body scanning is one of them. But always uh, trying to check, um, almost like your medical equipment, right? And I'm going to connect that with panic disorder because 
those folks with health anxiety are very likely to develop panic attacks and panic disorder because what happens with it is you have that emotion, you're checking constantly your physiology, then you start paying attention and everything feels weird because if you're watching your breathing, then you feel like you're not breathing enough and then all of a sudden you start getting anxious and then that anxiety leads to panic and then panic leads to this terrible discomfort and then you don't want to feel that. So it creates another layer of, of issues. So, you know, some patients feel like as soon as they get panicky, they have to do certain things, they have to lay down, they have to do this, they have to do, and so, or even in the past, people say, oh, take a deep breath, breathe and everything. And then that unfortunately reinforces it because like, what? nothing is wrong while you're doing this, right? So, um, so I think that, you know, health anxiety is a good catalyst for a lot of the anxieties and the issues that people have. And actually it's interesting, they create health issues. So um, like you end up doing too many tasks that could actually be damaging to your health. People do checks on their body that are actually very dangerous. So, you know, anything to do with any kind of mouth checking, you know, any kind of, you know, genitals and everything to, pe to the point that people hurt themselves, get infections, get in bad situations. They are trying to prevent something and unfortunately, they're causing something, right? Because they're causing a, 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 an illness or a, a concern like that. So, so I would say that that's really common and very concerning to us because those questions are very important to be asked by clinicians. W what do you do exactly uh, when you're trying to reassure yourself? And you would hear things that you would be like, that is not okay. Like, this is very dangerous. You know, people washing their eyeballs with chemicals to make sure that there's no chemicals in their eyes to make them blind. They're actually spending three, four hours in the shower with the water hitting on their eyes. That's a problem. You can't do that. That's that's not the right thing to do. So it's very important as a clinician to ask those questions because you can actually right away identify uh, a preventable damage that could happen from the symptoms. Wow. Yeah. I, I'm thinking of like the people that go and get a bunch of CT scans. You're only supposed to have a couple in your lifetime, but people are getting six a year and things like that. You At know, we, week. <laughs> right. It's like a punch it's card. So like every time you go in, they're just punching a new card. Yeah. Do you yeah, see a glowing, CTs. like a little glowing to Ethan, that, that beauty glowing? Yeah. Yeah. Thing? I'm a part of the trick. Oh, the kids love it. I just, I just, I'm, I'm a giant glow stick at a rave. It's fantastic. I just wanted to, I, I want to get to questions. I just wanted to quickly, I related so much to so much of what Katya just said in terms of compulsions. I mean, I've done, I, I did them all. Like I was temperature taking a hundred times a day. I talked about it a lot. I had a ritual around that. I wanted to cool off my body. I would lay under a fan completely naked to see if my body temperature would go down. But the checking and touching is like such a huge piece of it because, you know, I mean, how many times have I, you know, wait, is that a lump? Do I feel a lump right there? And then I'll, I'll you know, I'll push and check. I would have pushed and checked on it all day long and felt for it. And then you feel the other side because if it's on the other side, then it's safe because there's two of them, right? And it's, mm -hmm. it's meant to be there. But if it's that one, then you have a problem. And it really just continues the, uh, exacerbates the narrative, right? Because then you go on online and you read, you read, oh, well, it's only bad if the lump is sore. Well, yeah, it's been sore. I've been pressing on it for eight hours, right? So it, it, again, to Katya's point, it just starts to create the reality that you fear. Um, and it just exacerbates versus the willingness to like have it be there and sit with the discomfort and, you know, see, address it when you, when you cross that bridge. I wanted to jump into the treatment. So I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Moritz, and then you can talk about your personal experience, uh, Ethan. Do if somebody's experiencing this and they go and see someone like you, what should they expect in treatment? What is the goal of treatment and what are some of the specific interventions they'll engage with? Yeah, I mean, one thing that I find very interesting, and I, 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 uh, um, I, I'm very careful when we're talking about uh, people that are struggling with this type of symptoms because there's an invalidation piece here where they feel like this is my health, this is my life, this is life or death, right? And so it's very important to it, it help them understand that, you know, everything in a way is life or death when you drive, when you fly, when you do that. And, and, uh, but it's about life, not about death, right? So how do we want to live this life and what are the choices we're going to make? So that's very important to frame that correctly. Um, but also it's very, in my opinion, important that the person recognizes that they many times know that this is not okay, that they know that they are creating a bigger problem uh, by their actions. 
Uh, but at that moment, the moment of panic is really very difficult to predict and prevent the actions, right? So to me, it's really like a rehearsal. We need to learn to rehearse the moment of the feeling. When that feeling hits you, you know, you need a bit of an understanding of how you're going to manage differently. Because without that plan of what you do next, you are going to resort to you trying to calm yourself down and reassure yourself or do what you need to do. So I do think that understanding that this is not something that, you know, it's your volition. You're choosing to be worried about that and that's silly and why you're being silly. You're not being silly. You know, you are experiencing something that is terribly difficult and, and, and understanding that is important. So it's a mix of a lot of compassion, but also a lot of skills. So there are a lot of skills that you could use at the moment. There are some tools that you could go ahead and implement that would actually change the way the body is functioning. And it's very cool to watch because think about this. Anytime you get that first anxiety feeling, anxiety is a catalyst for a bunch of symptoms in your body, serious and big symptoms, right? And, and as Ethan is saying, some of them are new. Some of them change over time. Your anxiety changes over time, how it manifests itself. So it is a funny thing because you're creating that snowball effect by reassuring and reinforcing that anxiety sensation because then definitely you have much more to manage, right? So really understanding the underpinnings and the functioning of the behavior allows us to break that behavior in a certain way, teach very specific skills, right? So, so, so if you think about it, you know, the, the body is key, competent to do a, things that we can't even imagine. Like, so if I ask you, Chris, or you, Ethan, to do a back bend, you guys would be like, I'll break my back, right? <laughs> Um, but I could go to a, an athlete, a gymnast, and ask them to do a back bend, and they say, that's ridiculous. That's the easiest move of all the moves, right? Why? Is because they actually practice a skill to make their back bend for no, just easy, right? We need to teach a, bad, a back bend to people that have um, you know, health anxiety. They're going to do something that sounds extraordinary. You look at it, and you say, there is no way I would be able to have that thought and not take the action. Uh, but as they practice and practice, and then we have to support them on the back bend for a while, eventually we know exactly what to do. And Ethan is saying that if I get a thought and a health thing, I, do, I know how to bend. I know what I need to do now to not engage in a life, you know, spiral situation, right? 70% yeah. of the time. I just want to add, <laughs> I just want to add, I had the funniest um, memory when I was working with Katya in 2010, I mean, I would have done anything to go to the doctor. And when I was seeing her and her team, we had a, we had a contract in place that I was not allowed to go to a doctor or a hospital or anyone else unless they gave permission. And I was just throwing all kinds of things at them to try to get to the doctor. And I remember I was like on my way to residential and I was headed, I was headed to, um, had a few more sessions. And I remember talking to Dr. Moritz and she's like, she's like, you know, you can't go to the doctor no matter what, you can't go to the hospital. And I was finally like, yeah, but if I'm in a car accident, I can go to the doctor. And she's like, no. I'm like, what do you mean? No. She's like, I was like, if I like get in a horrific, and she's like, if you're on the street bleeding out, you can't go to the hospital. And I remember driving home that day going like driving so carefully. Cause I was like, <laughs> Oh my God, I'm not going to go to the hot. Now, obviously like, she, I, I don't want anybody to think that like, that was the therapy that she wanted me to die. Like I'm not, it's just a funny memory that I had in essence, like the most powerful thing that, that like Katya taught me and I didn't really get the messaging then was that this whole idea about like survival is you're surviving, you're attempting to survive to the point of that you're not thriving or even living, right? So it's this idea of creating the reality that you're afraid of. What was my fear? What if I die? What if I end up in the hospital? What if I can't live my life? What if I can't meet somebody or live toward my values? And what was I doing? All of that. I was doing all the things I was afraid of because I was spending all my time checking in this, right? The minute you sort of introduce this, well, are you willing to take a chance and die in order to live your life. And really that's, that's, that, that sounds extreme, but that's what we live with every day. We're willing to go outside. We're willing to walk downtown at night. We're willing to cross the street. We're willing to travel. We're taking on all kinds of risks. We are literally saying, I'm willing to accept the risks that are in front of me in order to live a value driven life. So by her saying like, look, you can't go to the hospital. You know, you have to risk the, the message wasn't, if you get in a car accident, you go to the, can't go to the hospital. The message is, be willing to take the risk because you're giving up your life in effort to save your life. And that was such a huge, go ahead, Katya. I know you have. 
No, no, but I, I think that's really important. And, and, and to tell you, I think that like ter- therapy in a box doesn't work for everyone because every patient presents differently. What we said, you know, to Ethan may be very different than we would say to someone else. Knowing Ethan's profile, we knew that he even could at that time potentially get himself in a car accident to go to the hospital. Right. And so um, the, that is a much higher probability than than him getting into a car accident and people not taking him to the hospital. You go into a car accident. None of us had control over that, by the way, Ethan. They will take it. To the what? Hospital. <laughs> what? <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> right? but, but, but telling him that he didn't have that right himself, that he couldn't choose going to the hospital, that that evaluation was going to be made by someone else took away OCD's power to say, I'm going to, I'm going to get in a car accident so I could get checked. Because when OCD is so loud, your reason is so low, right? And you will do certain things that are so out of control, like wh- why would you do that to yourself, that um, the thinking is not even there because the fear is so, so screaming and so loud that you are reactive, right? And so knowing the difference, uh, other people, we may have not said that to, and they say, hey, listen, car accidents are different, you know, but, you know, which is a tiny reassurance, but more normal, right? But knowing the extremes requires an extreme, right? So so when you think about Ethan, you know, um, you know, story, which he beautifully and eloquently shares with us is, you know, all of us, right, is a a story of like, how far can your brain push you to get what he wants from you? And we knew that there was no negotiating with the terrorist and the terrorist was an Ethan was his OCD. And he had a bad terrorist in him, right? And, And OCD was, I didn't hear the question coming from Ethan. Well, what if I get into a car accident? I heard that question coming from a place which I heard that talk before, which is, oh, what if the, you know, they come to me instead of me going to the hospital? That was the same talk, the same conversation. So I think that in terms of clinical work, us as clinicians, we have to have a very good clinical listening skills. We have to separate out what is education, reassurance, and danger. Because there is danger in this conversation. When I said to Ethan something like that, am I risking? Yeah, but probability versus possibility. I really, really don't think that there is a strong chance of Ethan being in a car accident, bleeding, and and saying to the cops, I won't go to the hospital because Dr. Moritz told me not to. I don't think that was going to happen. He'll be like, oh, you want to take me to the hospital? Let's go. I'm ready. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so I think that knowing, knowing the nuances. So, so, so I think that, that, that I think my biggest message in this topic is it health anxiety is not the same for anyone, even though you may have the same fears, it will present itself in so many different ways. The, the, the pain, the, the anxiety, the reaction, the physiology, so many variables play a role. I would say probably hundreds of variables are playing a role in that symptom that if you say, oh, someone has health anxiety, everyone that has anxiety has health anxiety the same way. I'll be honest with you, in my career, I haven't seen people have the same type and the same exact presentation with the same nuances. Maybe they will worry about the same things but they are not the same at all. They don't function the same. And then their environment plays an enormous role. So let's say Ethan's parents were a little nervous about him, only child, beautiful boy, they may react too. And they may be like, oh my God, let's take him to the doctor, he's sick. Other parents would be like, you know what? Dude, we're too busy. You went to the hospital or the doctor twice, you're fine, go play. Right. So there is an environmental component that you can't forget a variable that we have to uh, you know, account for. And so it's not one symptom. The same for everyone is each person interacts with that symptom and fear in a different way. Well said. I'm going to uh, there's Beth made two comments. I'm going to throw one to you uh, to, to one of you, Ethan, and then one of you, one to you, Dr. Moritz, because I think they're both good comments. The first one, Amanda, comes from Beth at uh, twelve thirteen about thought I was having a heart attack, but it was anxiety. So I'll, I'll throw that to you first, Ethan. Can you tell me a little bit or, or kind of talk to Beth a little bit and talk to, to everybody watching, like how 
the the symptomology of the OCD can sometimes be misread as actual like health conditions because I hear that a lot with this uh, s- uh, subtype is like I keep going to the doctor and they keep telling me it's anxiety but it feels like I'm dying so how did you navigate how to how to tell the difference yeah, it feels really dismissive at first right because you're actually having physiological symptoms physical symptoms I think understanding what anxiety is was really helpful for me you know what the purpose of anxiety is what the symptoms of anxiety are um, you know why we sweat why our heart races it, they're all survival. They're all pieces of survival. Our heart races to pump blood to our limbs so we can move faster and escape the monster. We sweat because we become harder to grab. It's actually really interesting if you read what anxiety symptoms are, why we experience in them. You know, um, I think that um, there are very common. I mean, if you look at the list of like anxiety symptoms, it's literally every symptom. <laughs> I mean, there's yeah. it's just the laundry list of every symptom, right? So how do you know the difference if it's anxiety or not? I think you have to look at one. What are the most common anxiety symptoms? You know, heart palpitations, sweaty, dizziness, nausea, headache. You know, even blurred vision, things like that. And number two, understanding your own symptomatology and how you respond and react to situations. You know, Katya said something. I remember when I was getting better, and I was like, how do I know? when to actually go to the doctor and when to not go to the doctor, you know? And she was just like, you'll know. It's not, it's not a debate. If it's a debate and you think you may, but maybe not, that's OCD most likely, right? So it was like, and, and it, so far that, that piece of knowledge has consistently turned out to be absolutely true. When I fell hiking and I heard a pop in my ankle and my ankle was this big, I wasn't going, could this be OCD? I was like, no, I need to go to the ER. This is problematic, right? Um, and, uh, and, and there's been other instances where I couldn't breathe or I was having asthma or whatever, or legit chest pains. Right. And other times there have been times where they, it seemed like an awfully good illusion, but I was like, Oh, I'm having doubt. I don't, this doesn't feel like an emergency. I'm questioning this too much. This feels awfully like OCD. And, And on top of that, I'm perhaps willing to sit with that discomfort a little longer to see if it becomes something that I should pay attention to that reaches that point where there's absolutely no question I need to go to the ER. Um, and that's kind of my approach to it all is like, you know, if, if I start questioning and debating and looking for the gray areas, I usually chalk that up to OCD and anxiety, even though it's really, really uncomfortable. And then if it's like pretty cut and dry for me, then that's that's a reason to go. But yeah. anxiety, yeah, go ahead, Katya. No, no, go ahead. No, 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 I'm done. Um, what I would say that usually like feeling that you're having a heart attack and it is an anxiety attack, is more connected to panic than really OCD itself, right? So panic disorder, panic attacks are physiological responses that are normal to the human body, which is a false alarm, or you can call a fire drill, right? So our bodies need to, like Ethan is saying, you know, physiological fear responses allow us to fight or flight, which allows us to stay alive. So when there were, you know, lions out there, you know, and we needed to protect ourselves, you know, it was really good. We actually had that sensation of a tail vision, you know, your heart is racing, being so you can run, you know, and you're actually numb and you don't feel anything because you have to fight or flight, right? Uh, but uh, evolutionarily, um, that, that, that situation is not as common to happen. And, and it, when you feel those feelings, like it's a funny thing, if there was a lion that walked into this room right now, I wouldn't be questioning my panic feeling. I would be questioning, oh my God, there's a lion. I have to run. I have to figure out what to do. Right. <laughs> but because those symptoms happen when there is no lion, then we think we're dying. You know, so I like the possibility of lo- looking at what are the other options, you know, Yes, you could be having a heart attack. You can be have silent heart attack. You can be having a what, what, anything, right? Um, but is it possible that I'm having an anxiety and a panic reaction because I have this panic sensation? So knowing what the panic sensations are allows you to notice like, oh, I'm feeling that way and therefore I'm going to write it out, right? Um, and then go forward. You know, I very rarely hear people having a heart attack saying, oh, I didn't go to the hospital. I thought I was having a panic attack, right? Uh, you know, because unfortunately, and fortunately, you know, and I don't want to reassure you because that's not the goal, but it, the goal is educating people too. You know, my, my first ever work, you know, my first dissertation was on panic disorder and fear of heart attacks because at that time, doctors didn't really know about panic disorder. And everyone that would show up in the hospital, they thought they were having a heart attack 
when they were having symptoms of anxiety. So I was fascinated by the fact that the enormous amount of workup that was done in cardiac patients that weren't cardiac patients were panic disorder or panic attack uh, patients. And, and then the pendulum swung so much further in the future, like many years later, where people learned about panic attacks and everything was a panic attack, right? So, but there's very clear, you know, symptoms and histories and things that people do in, 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 in developing a pattern. Um, but in our lifetime, all of us are going to have a panic attack, likely. All of us are going to have the experience of we think we're dying and we're not dying. Um, and we all need to learn to manage that because at the moment we become really afraid and avoidant, that's when it's going to come back again. So, yeah. so that's the issue. I just want to yeah. add, you know, Chris, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no. I, I, this is such a huge thing. I think that, um, you know, an important realization is this idea that um, I hate when I lose the train of thought. Oh, it's so annoying because it was a really good realization. Um, okay. I think that, you know, uh, I see in the comments a lot that people are talking about like, yeah, but I had this thing or I actually ha did have something or this did come up. The reality is, is yes. And it's not that OCD was right. It's that pe that that there's coincidence and there will be times when you actually do have something legitimate. And that's fair. I think we, at the end of the day, we have to weigh what's taking away from our life. Is it the fear? Is it the OCD or the reality that something's going to happen? It's like when I start weighing those two things, I'm a lot more willing to sit with the risk that something may be legitimately happening to me in favor of leaning toward it will probably be OCD and panic and anxiety in order to not go down that rabbit hole that closed off my life for so long. And if it gets to that point where it's very clear that, oh, this is a problem, this is not that thing, then I will know and then make a decision in that moment. But I feel like it's all about weighing your options. And my option for me is I really don't want to go back down that rabbit hole of every time OCD you know, puts a question in my head, I'm going to go run to the doctor, even if there's something physical associated with it, with it. I'm not saying I'm perfect at that. I'm not saying I have the most amazing distress tolerance out there. I don't. But what I am willing to say is, you know, this is going to sound weird, but I would almost rather have ca catch cancer at stage two than stage one and not give into OCD and be a little bit later than, than risk going back down that hell. Because I know for a fact that OCD will take my life long before anything else will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Uh, I want to put up best comment. I'll throw this to you, Ethan. And then there's a clinical question that I have for Dr. Moritz. Um, it's uh, 1213. There was a comment by Beth that says, still afraid of the pandemic, haven't been out in three years, get food, take out trash. That's it. I'm on house arrest. Kind of expanding beyond COVID. There's always seems to be every year like a big health scare. Also, sometimes people will live in an area and they hear that there was like an oil spill on the ocean or um, there was a city in L.A., Porter Hill or something. There was a gas leakage. Like how can someone navigate this this uh, this subtype when there really is things in the news about swine flu, about Ebola, like all these different conditions? How did you navigate um, so you could still function when there was all of that out there in the media? I mean, I think it just comes down to any other approach to OCD, which is embracing the uncertainty and being able to live and tolerate with the possibility that something may happen. You know, Katya talked about probability versus possibility. And, you know, while you don't want to get too in the weeds with logic to try to determine, OK, I have a 0.3 percent chance of getting this. So therefore, I'm going to take a risk. You know, the reality of it is, is, is it interfering with your values? And if it is or isn't, you know, make a decision in accordance with your values. Nobody's sitting here saying if the water's if there's a sign I was I went to Naples over Christmas, the hurricane had just hit and it said, don't go in the water. There's poop there. You know, that wasn't the exact sign, but that was the bottom line. It's like, OK, you know, my values are I like going in the ocean. But you know what? I'm probably not going to go in if there's poop and sewage there. Right. So like that was an obvious choice for me. But I think ultimately we, we have to follow our values and our goals and what's important to us and be living, willing to live with a certain amount of risk. I, I just snorted. That was super. I heard weird. that. <laughs> okay, I don't know why that happened. The example that I love to give was like, if, if they reported on, if the news and media reported on traffic accidents, like they did on COVID, right? If, if they did that right now, if every time somebody got in a car accident, if they quickly cut cut to the programming, cut to news, showed a graph, like none of us would get in a car. Guaranteed, I would be terrified the way they were like, you know, um, covering COVID and like every case ticking up and up all day. All if they were doing that with car accidents. I guarantee you none of us would be driving. 
right? So at the end of the day, it's your willingness to embrace uncertainty. Regardless, I don't think there's any more risk now or, than there was before, right? We're just all connected and there's so much more information, all that stuff, but every generation has their thing and ours is COVID and this war and that war and so forth. So ultimately, you know, try to yeah. do your best. Yeah, go ahead, Katya. Well, I, I, I agree with you, Ethan, and I think that, you know, um, Beth, uh, for you is, you know, you know, the fear is really what's keeping you at home, not the pandemic anymore, right, is the fear. Uh, because, you know, if you look around, um, you know, the world um, has kind of tried to regain the trust that, that we were not going to, you know, all die from it. And that the chances of us, you know, not living uh, are, are much slimmer. But at, for three years now, if you can't get your food and get take out your trash and be with people you love and everything, the pandemic actually is stealing your life from you. So it's actually the fear that is really, you know, affecting. And so for me, if I can wish you something is courage, right? Because the only way out is through it. And so for all of us that, you know, all of us experience what you are hopefully going to experience soon, which is it's a little scary in the beginning, but all of a sudden you look like, yeah, you know what? It, it seems to be okay. We were in the world before the pandemic and there was the flu and all the other stuff that we lived with. So now, you know, the pandemic, it showed us another condition and we need courage to go ahead and move forward. And so that's, that, that's how I would uh, approach this is like courage, like saying, okay, well, you know what, if everybody else could do it, why would I take my life and not do it for myself? Um, and at Ethan is saying, like, if they say an announcement, there's poop in the water, don't go in the water. Or when they made the announcement, don't go out because of COVID, we all followed. But if everybody is not, no longer announced or followed and we got stuck on it, the idea is to have courage to move forward. Katya, a, a technical question at 1216 from Kaylai on YouTube. Um, you know, hypochondriasis, OCD, health anxiety, health anxiety disorder, health illness disorder, uh, somatic symptom disorder. Does it matter um, to get that like specific diagnosis or what is the difference is basically what they're asking. So Amanda, it's at 1216 from Kali. So I know there's a couple different DSM things. It, does it, it, it necessarily tomato, matter? tomatoes, tomato, tomatoes, tomatoes kind of a feeling for me. The reality is there's one thing here. Your brain got stuck on the fear that something terrible health-wise is going to happen that you must prevent. You want to call this hypochondriasis, booga, 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 you know, health anxiety, whatever you want to call it, to me is the need to help the brain realize that I am not going to live my life in the fear that you're giving me. You're giving me too much fear over something that does not need that kind of protection. Now, Someone has a gun to my head. Yes, that fear is the fear I want to listen to because there is an imminent danger to my brain. Now, if I could possibly have this and that and have it, that's just not going to take my whole air and my moment and my life, right? So whatever name we want to call it, there may be a difference in kind of criteria here and there. But the big gist of it is that having a fear of something bad happening to your health that is not based on, you know, scientific information or test results and things that are, you know, given to you, but a fear, not, uh, you know, data at that moment. And even with data, if you blow it up even more, like, you, you know, Ethan saying, I have a headache. Yeah, you do have a headache, but headaches are data, but they don't equal, equal to brain cancer. They equal to 1 million things and very rarely to brain cancer. So I'm not gonna go to the brain cancer first. We're gonna stay on this world here first, right? So I don't think the name matters. I think the presentation is what is important. All right, so I have a last question for each of you before we go. So I'm going to give you, uh, uh, Dr. Moritz, um, at 12.22, I see this question that's common a lot. So I'll pull, basically, it's a similar question. So I'll pull it from Linda at 12.22. And it says, what about people who have previously had heart attacks or cancer or strokes? Like Love Lana says later, like I have a, 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 a aortic valve and, and other things. So Clinically, what for the people that have had past health issues or current health issues, how do they navigate this subtype? Because I think that's what really gets them is like, but I had this before, or this is, is sometimes a little bit more intense. Yeah, that's a very complex one. And we navigate that very carefully too, because 
Uh, we have people that are afraid of a heart attack that had a heart attack. We have people that are afraid of getting the stomach virus because they had the stomach virus. We have, you know, and, and I'm comparing not that they're equal, but they're all like experiences, right? Uh, the reality is, is that uh, you, we're not asking you to do things that you're not supposed to do to prevent a heart attack. So I'm not telling you to go ahead and, you know, gain a hundred pounds right now and have your cholesterol not checked and do all kinds. We're not going to do that. You're going to do what you can control to prevent a heart attack. Uh, but the hypervigilance of the heart attack is a negative for your health and your heart. So teaching you not to be hypervigilant and be constantly worrying about that allows the stress in your body to be lessened, therefore helping, right? Um, you know, helping you to go ahead and live a better life, right? So I, I think that that is very important because, you know, it's not about changing the preventative normal behaviors. So you are like anyone else preventing a heart attack and in your case, maybe a little more. So there are some things that you do like, so for instance, if Ethan never had a heart attack, Maybe I wouldn't tell him to go to the cardiologist every few months that he needs to get a checkup, but someone who did their doctor may say, I want you here and I want a stress test every six months. And that's very appropriate. That's a very preventative measure. But to go and spend all day worrying that you're going to have another one, that's not a good measure of, for your health either. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. And then the last question I'm going to give it for you, Ethan, is um, I just had it. Uh, it was at uh, 1250 from uh, Charmaine Smith. And there was another question earlier. So I was debating which one to go to, but they're similar. So um, how can you navigate? This person says they had a panic attack. Um, it wasn't real, but now it's convinced them that it might be allergies. So now they're scared. They don't know if it's panic or allergies or, or the earlier question was, you know, sometimes like there's medical gaslighting, like people telling you there's nothing there and invalidation and medical. So the, the, the final question I want for you then to kind of wrap those two is how you now moving forward, do you navigate the difference between this was like a one-time thing or this is my anxiety or this is a health thing and, and navigate doctor's appointments so it's not compulsive? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think like, you know, I don't want to speak so specifically to Charmaine. It was Charmaine, I think you said. Yeah, because, 1250, Amanda. Yeah. Just because I don't have a lot of insight. What I can say for me is that, you know, it's a balance between understanding my history, my symptomatology, knowing that I have an OCD diagnosis, know that it, knowing that I have a panic disorder and anxiety diagnosis, and taking all of those things into consideration when deciding when it's something I want to pay attention to, whether I should pay attention to it or not. I actually, I can only speak from my own lived experience. I will go into a doctor, whether they're new or old, and, and I will immediately say, I have anxiety, I have OCD, these are my diagnosis, it's well managed, but... And I err on this side because I personally don't want extra tests. I don't want extra things that are reassuring. I, I, I want them to know ahead of time. And I also, I personally don't feel dismissed. I actually, and I understand the dismissive nature of like, oh, it's all in your head, right? That's, that's really stigmatizing and that's not always the case. But for me, I want doctors to know where I'm coming from because I want them, I want to understand what they're deciding. Let me rephrase that. Doctors will do a lot to reassure. That is their job, right? To make sure that everything is okay and you feel good and comfortable and for insurance reasons, right? So I don't want to be prescribed tests just to be reassured. I want to be prescribed tests because it's medically valid to do so. So I want doctors to have as much history about me as possible so then they can make judgment calls based on their medical expertise. The reality of any of this stuff, what Katya was talking about, about the heart attack, is OCD will rarely, if ever, be satisfied. We're never, we're never going to do enough to satisfy OCD. Right. That's the reality. So for me, I know I assess the situation and I also rely on my clinicians and my therapists and my support group. I can recognize when I don't have a lot of insight into something and I will lean on the people that I trust to say, hey, what do you think? Is this something I should pay attention to or not? And we figure it out together. But I think knowing your own history and what you err toward, if you're more cautious and you run more times to the doctor than not, then, you know, take that if, if you, you suddenly got allergies um, you know, if you had an allergic reaction to something and that's, that's valid, you know, going to the doctor for the first time and getting that checked out to make sure that everything's okay. That doesn't seem bad to me. If you have a history of panic attacks and it manifests like that, you know, then maybe recognize that that's what, that's what it could be. But I would say you have to assess the bigger picture to then make informed and educated decisions. Well said, well, thank you. But, oh, go on. Okay. I just want, I just want to say, you know, that, 
um, you know, allergies uh, and, and physiological responses, uh, they, they differ, they are different at times, right? So we have different ways that our body uh, uh, behave. And so when you say, I feel my throat is closing, and, and, that, and that was the symptom, I think really educating ourselves on how anxiety can make you feel anything. Uh, and uh, allergies, they just don't feel like something. They continue on and on and on, right? So if you ever had an allergic reaction, I had one yesterday, I have my face is all kind of bumped up from it, right? It was, you know, you start feeling the differences. And I, I totally hear what you're saying as someone who suffers from allergies, you know, and I, I, I actually sometimes have that feeling. I'm like, oh, is this an allergic reaction? And a lot of the times it's just like a fear of the allergic reaction too, right? So we, we really all have that you know, uh, in, in many different levels, but it's how you really manage that in your life. Really well said. Um, my anxiety is always not getting to all the questions. So the good thing is we have a doc uh, behind the scenes that has questions we don't get to. And I, there was about five we didn't get to. So I, I slapped them into that doc that either uh, Ethan can address um, at the next community conversations or Dr. M uh, Liz McInville and myself will be back next Wednesday. I believe that's the third. Don't quote me on the date. I'm horrible on dates. May 3rd, I think it is. Um, but we're here the first and third Wednesday of each month at 9 a.m. 12 Eastern um, is just an ask the expert. So those five questions we didn't get to, if you're like, Hey, Chris, you didn't ask my question, come back next Wednesday, same time. I put them at the top of the doc and I make sure I'll make sure that Liz and I answer them. And then as always, you can go to iocf.org slash uh, peace of mind to find out all the scheduling for the month coming up in May of live streams. I want to first and foremost, thank, um, everybody that attended the live stream as Ethan can, can attest to, we, we always appreciate showing up and seeing the robust conversation in the chat people supporting each other and you all just supporting our live streams. We're honored. I want to thank you so much to our guests, obviously Ethan, who is a, a great uh, live stream host. Make sure you go Tuesday evenings. It's four for me, but I know it's seven for the East coast um, and watch him in, in, in community conversations and also IOCF town halls. And then obviously Dr. Moritz, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much for being the live stream here and adding your uh, expertise. And thank you for you two kind of opening up on your journey, working together. I really, really appreciate that. Real quick final announcement because I saw Katie in the chat and I don't want her to attack me. Don't forget um, the uh, Faith and OCD conference is so close. It's coming May 1st. Um, it's a great place for people with OCD and scrupulosity or navigating mental health and their faith. It's great for clinicians that want to understand that that world a little bit better. And then it's also amazing for faith leaders. So make sure that you look that up as well as, of course, the 28th annual conference in San Francisco, uh, which is like the biggest gathering. Uh, we'll all be there in person. So go to iocf.org and you can click on conferences and see all of that. Um, also make sure to go to youtube.com uh, slash iocf to see this recording and others put up afterwards. And always go to iocf.org for all of your resources. One last thank you, of course, to Ethan Smith and Dr. Moritz, and we'll be back next Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 Eastern. Take care, and I hope you learned something today. Appreciate you, too. Thank you. Thank you.